with uh, Canto 4 of Paradise, we are now in the heaven of the moon, which, as you know by now, is also the, the, heav the heaven of grammar. And, and I will show you in what way this is the, the heaven of grammar. Uh, in, in Paradiso 3, Dante meets uh, two women. Uh, the Empress Constance, and the irony of the name is a little bit obvious, uh, among the inconstant spirits, and Picarda. Picarda, who also had uh, joined the cloister, had taken the name of Sister Constance, she too, but uh, was forced to leave the cloister on account of uh, uh, her, her brothers, Corso Donati's uh, uh, political maneuvers. He wanted her married to an ally of his. Um, I, with Canto IV, Dante returns on this issue, which is the issue really uh, of uh, the will. What is the will? How can uh, somebody else's force on me um, for, uh, co compel me to do things that I am accountable for? In what way am I accountable for somebody else's uh, imposition of, uh, in this, this case, his will on me? Uh, Dante wants to know uh, what is the will here. Uh, but there's an, another question that forces him to, that another problem forces him to raise a question in Canto IV, and uh, the question is uh, uh, Dante's wonder about the souls in the various stars. They are disposed and arranged on, uh, in, in the various planets. He sees some souls here on the moon. So he wonders, are we in Plato's um, paradise? Is, this, is Plato right in believing that the souls at death return to the stars, to the place of origin. And these are the two questions that he has, uh, he has to uh, raise. So uh, the canto begins with a statement that is in extraordinary. Uh, I, I will try to explain how the two questions are, are related, in what way uh, they are related. They are not just absolutely arbitrary. There is a, 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 a certain link between them. Uh, but the, it begins, the canto four, begins in a very, with, a, with, a, uh, with a, a rather strange formulation about the, 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 the nature of the will and the freedom of the will. So since that's what, const, uh, that, that's what Picarda's situation had forced Dante to raise, what is the will? Is somebody else's will uh, forcing me to do something? Am I still responsible for it? And Dante has to clarify what the will is. So he starts with a statement that seems to suggest that the will is inert. Now, this is a, 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 a poem uh, that the will cannot really make decisions, first of all. The will, uh, given the opportunity to choose between two contradictory objects of desire, can't quite move one way or the other. You need the intellect, that's the argument that makes the will take, make a decision, will force the will to make a decision. And this is the way he starts, between two foods at equal distance, and equally tempting, a free man would die of hunger before he brought either to his lips. And uh, he, so a lamb would stand between the cravings of two fierce wolves in equal fear of both. This seems to be a kind of will that joins human beings and animals, such that paralyzes us, the choices paralyzes the will. So that maybe when we speak about freedom of the will, we are not speaking really about freedom of the will, we're speaking about the freedom of the will in the intellect. It's the intellect that has to be free. So that's, that's really the argument. Uh, so would a hound stand between two does. Therefore, this is the, it's a, three images that introduce Dante's own doubts and perplexities. He has two questions. Each of them seems com more compelling than the other. It does not know what to ask first. So would a hound stand between two does? Therefore, if I kept silence, urged equally by my doubts, another blame, 
nor commend myself, since it was of necessity. I was silent, but my desire was painted on my face, and with it my question far more warmly than in plain words. So Dante is indeed talking about the limitations of the will, not that the will is, this is an averroist position. It's a position of a radical interpretation of Aristotle, that the will is inert, that you always need some kind of the power of the intellect to make you decide. The intellect cannot move, but the intellect can make the will move. So that the statement has to be understood as one of the hierarchy between intellect and will. Now, so the argument now continues. Beatrice did as did Daniel when he appeased the wrath of Nebuchadnezzar that made him cruelly unjust. And she said, I see well how one desire and another draw thee, so that their eagerness itself binds itself and does not get breath. That's the reason. If the right will endures, on what ground does another's violence lessen the measure of my desert? How can it be? that uh, Picarda, who was forced by somebody else's will, it seems to appear in the lowest, the, the lowest birth of beatitude. She's on the moon. Why should she be so undeserving of, of, of a closer intimacy to God? Um, so that's his question. Also, it gives the perplexity that the soul seems to return to the stars in agreement with Plato's teaching. These are the questions that press equally on thy will. First then I shall deal with the one which has more poison in it. And it's very interesting, first of all, the, the language of poison, but the, the, this idea of what is dangerous of the two questions is not the question about the will. The, the question which is more dangerous is the question that deals with representation. What is the mode of appearance of the souls in heaven? And why should representation, do the souls inhabit the stars? Are they showing themselves forth here? It is a make-believe that they are here. It's a fiction. It's pyrotechnics, if you wish. And once the night is over, then the souls return to the proper, ab proper abode, which may, may not be visible to the pilgrim. Is this a theatrical performance? And why, if this is a theatrical, and it is, why should that be a question that has more poison in it? Why the, what, what, what's so dangerous about representation? That's really the argument that, as Dante puts it uh, forth here at the beginning, at, at least. And then she goes on. First of all, let's discuss it. And then we, as we discuss it, we try to understand uh, the question why this is representation uh, such, such a, a, a hard issue. And she says, not he of the seraphim, this is lines, Paradiso 4, lines 28, that is most made one with God, the, the, in the choir of angels, those who are closest to God, not Moses, Samuel, or whichever John thy will, none, the apostle or the visionary, the seer, not Mary herself have their set seat in other heaven from these spirits that have now appeared to thee. This is the poetics of paradise, by the way, that we are really confronted with. How do the souls show themselves forth to the pilgrim? What is the mode of Dante's representation in paradise? From the spirits that have not appeared to nor for their being have more years or fewer, but all make fair the first circle and hold sweet life in different measure as they feel more and less the eternal breath. These what you are seeing here and, uh, on the moon, are, are sh have shown themselves here, not that the sphere is allotted to them, but in sign of the heavenly rank that is least exalted. They, have, uh, they enjoy a lower degree of beatitude than the other souls, so they just appear here for your benefit. In other words, the whole of paradise, the representation of paradise is fictional, and once the pilgrim disappears, so will the souls vanish. They will return into the bosom of Abraham in, uh, according to biblical accounts. Uh, it is necessary, now Dante explains why the need for this allegorization, this allegorical, allegorical language, allegorical representation. It is necessary to speak thus 
to your faculty, since only from sense perception does it grasp that which it then makes fit for the intellect. So the whole of paradise is literally an accommodation of verities, of realities that far exceed the powers of our mind, and now it's, it's, it's a, uh, a condescension. The souls condescend to show themselves down to us. So Dante, first of all, has been talking about the limitations of the will. Now he's talking about the limitations of the intellect. So these are the two issues that join, intellectually speaking, the, the canto four. And each seems to need the other. Uh, and be made stronger in the light of the other. And Dante goes on explaining this, uh, this uh, mode of representation, which he says is not only true for paradise, but it's true for scripture, it's true for all the iconography of the churches, and that's what he says. It's necessary to speak um, for this reason, scripture condescends in the, in the literal sense of the word, in the etymological sense, it comes down to us, uh, it's, it's, it accommodates itself to our limited faculties, condescends to your capacity, and attributes hands and feet to God having another meaning. That's the definition of an allegory. The Bible indeed speaks of the hand of God. It's an anthropomorphic trope. The God has no feet and has no hand. And what it means, it's something else. It means the power of God or the majesty of God, the feet of God, etc. So with the feet. But in other words, there is, there is a, a language of representation, even in the Bible, that in many ways authorizes Dante's own use of representation. Is this clear so far? Good. There's no, 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 real, no real difficulty in this, uh, this issue. Um, and then he continues, for this reason, etc. Um, and Holy Church, but that's what happens in the Bible. We talk about the feet of God. We read about the feet of God and the head of God. Holy Church represents to you with human aspect angels that have no human form, Gabriel and Michael, and the other who made Tobit whole again. And now the distinction between the metaphor, the Platonic metaphor, and the biblical allegory. What Timaeus argues about the souls is not like that what we see here. For what he says, he seems to hold for truth. That's already one, one, one basic difference. It, is, it seems that what's, what for the Bible is a metaphor becomes true in the context of the Timaeus. He says, Plato says, the soul returns to its own star from which he believes it to have been separated when nature gave it for form. He literalizes the idea of the souls returning, return to the stars. But perhaps his view is other than his words express and may have a meaning not to be despised. If he means to return to the return to his wheels of the honor and blame of their influence, if by returning to the stars he seems to imply that at the fall of the souls, the souls go through the various stains of the planets and, and, and then the return to this, the, 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 the planets from which they originated, his bow perhaps strikes a certain truth. The principle he understood once misled almost the whole world so that it went astray, naming them Jupiter and Mercury and Mars, etc. So Dante's, um, uh, then, then Beatrice, let me just continue. The other doubt, this is the language of doubts, intellectual doubts, which are always part of truth for Dante, it's the truth that generates, a truth that generates doubt because the mind is exa exactly the way he described the will. Both are restless. Both need uh, nourishment, constant nourishment. So these are intellectual doubts. The other doubt that troubles the, the has less poison. He repeats this idea, less danger. He hasn't said yet why. The world of representation is dangerous. And actually, he leaves it at, 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 at this, because its mischief could not lead thee away from me. The other justice, that other justice appears unjust in the eyes of mortals is evidence of faith. We'll go back and we'll go in a moment. But let me stay with, uh, with the first question that Beatrice has resolved uh, for the pilgrim and for us. She's, she's distinguishing between the theology, the biblical theology, and let's call it the philosophical uh, allegory. Uh, biblical allegory and philosophical allegory. 
the language of metaphor in the Bible as, and the language of metaphor truth in, uh, in Plato. Uh, and Dante himself clearly is here legitimizing his own use of metaphor. <coughs> the whole poem is indeed a metaphorical journey um, whereby Dante is both simultaneously uh, biblical and also philosophical. He, he's, 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 sh sh he's finding and trying to decide on the common ground, the metaphorical language that the Bible and Plato will use, and, and therefore himself. But why is representation so dangerous, that has so po much poison in it, and Beatrice twice goes back to that image. And I think that the answer is this, that representation has the power to cancel or erase the world of references which it represents. Representation has the power to, um, to make appearances the only reality, simulacra, the only reality that we manage to see. And it literally covers it, it eclipses all references. That's what makes representation so dangerous. It has a, we, we are, uh, by virtue of the representation, we end up in a kind of quandary in the predicament of believing that that's all that there is, that that which is visible is the only real thing. And invest the appearance, invest that, uh, that, uh, that simulacrum with the sort of value that it normally does not have, because it actually it points normally that doesn't have, because it points for Dante to essences behind it. We have seen here the souls. The souls are not. This is not the real home for the spirits. The real home is somewhere else. We may make the mistake Dante made of believing that the souls actually live in, on the moon, and therefore that we are in a platonic other world, in another world where the souls go back to it. The journey of Dante is the journey between images and uh, testing of what these images may mean, finding out whether this, in behind these images there is some kind of substance, some kind of reality. Dante literally moves between the two words and things, images uh, or representations and, and appearances and the world of essences. And, 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 and tries to join the two of them. So you understand why representation is the key issue here. Uh, let me also add that this discourse on allegory justifies and gives you an idea why Dante has been, uh, that this is the heaven of grammar, since the allegorical discourse is a grammatical issue. You remember that I've been talking about how each planet seems to, to deploy uh, uh, well, one of the liberal arts, but this is the, the reason why we can connect uh, our grammar and, uh, and, and the moon. The other problem that Dante raises in Canto 4 is the question of uh, the will. And, uh, and he, 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 that's an easier issue because he just uh, goes on distinguishing between what we call a conditional will, the co will, what we will whenever we are beset by circumstances that force on us some resolutions, and then absolute will. The absolute will of the martyrs, of those who are, for instance, who are unwavering, unfaltering in uh, their confrontation with, uh, with particular experiences, okay? So uh, the souls of this, uh, of, uh, of Picarda and Costanza, they were really uh, exer exercising their own conditional will, not their absolute will. So it's an interesting distinction, and we leave it at that. Um, we move now instead to the heaven of to Canto VI, the heaven of dialectics of Mercury. Uh, why Mercury is the, why should he be the god? Uh, this is the planet Mercury, but the god uh, tied with dialectics or logic, which are really not exactly the same thing, but Dante does use them interchangeably. Uh, Hermes is, of course, the, the god known, the psychopomp. The one who brings, you know, you know that the, the part of mythology, the god who brings messages to to the world, the, the, the realm of, sh of of shades, the realm of the dead, yeah, the carries the souls to Hades, 
that's one of the, the, the ideas of uh, uh, the resonances of Mercury. But there is also others that Mercury is the god who, uh, the bearer of laws, the bearer of messages of the gods to human beings, the bearer of laws, uh, the, the, uh, the god of the marketplace, though it doesn't seem to have uh, much, much impact, a particular relevance, uh, particular resonance of the myth to this, uh, this canto. And it's the uh, logic, uh, what is to, what, or dialectics, what are we to understand by dialectics is one of the uh, arts of the trivium, and it is the art by which, by means of which, which provides really a method. That's the way it's defined. It provides a method to distinguish between truth and falsehood. Uh, so it's, it's uh, let's see how this is going to be present. Interestingly enough, Dante is really talking about laws here, and actually here he meets the great a uh, theorist, uh, the, 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 the Emperor Justinian, who is responsible and who is usually acknowledged as the one who favored the reorganization of Roman law in, uh, in Byzantium, which is where he lived. Um, okay, and, and Dante not only meets Justinian, but he also tells the story of Rome. So it's a canto about history. And the, the, the idea is, what's the rationality of Roman history is there in rationality to it. If dialectics is also the the uh, the science of uh, uh, the power to distinguish between falsehood and truth, it's also a rational, uh, a rational uh, discipline. The discipline that follows uh, the rule of reason by means of which one can go on making those distinctions. So the question becomes: What is the rationality of the Roman Empire? What kind of of, of justice uh, was there in it. So laws and uh, the same word, logos, uh, seems to be ruling the unfolding of uh, this canto. And th it begins with uh, the story of Constantine, whom we have met before for the famous, as we accountable for the donation of Constantine that you may know. Uh, it's the famous uh, alienation of uh, imperial property to the church for Constantine's, as Constantine's token of gratitude to the Pope, uh, Sylvester, uh, who had cured him of leprosy. And this gave uh, rise to a famous, uh, uh, much debated uh, donation, uh, which Dante dismisses, or Dante views as nothing less transgressive, not, nothing less tragic and disruptive of the order of the world than, for instance, Adam's sin. It's really the same uh, cosmic proportion uh, because it mixes together the sacred and the profane. It makes the pope a temporal ruler, and, and, and that is the, the ultimate degradation of the, moral, of the moral authority, the exercise of moral authority from uh, Dante's viewpoint. So this is, uh, uh, this is the allusion to the donation, but the allusion to the donation here is taken into now, the, uh, the reference to Constantine has a slightly different uh, uh, sense. After Constantine, he says, turned back the ego against the course of heaven, where it had followed behind him of old that took Lavinia to wife, for 200 years and more, the bird of God, the eagle, the emblem of the empire, remained on the bounds of Europe, near the mountains from which it first came forth. And there ruled the world under the shadow of the sacred wings, passing from hand to hand, and so changing came into mine. I was Caesar, uh, the imperial uh, title, the imperial persona has disappeared, and now he appears as I am Justinian. Here, once again, the use of that, 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 that shift of verbs from the past to the present. And now I'm in the eternal life. I am myself a Justinian, who, by will of the primal love which moves me, removed from the laws what I was superfluous and, uh, and vain. Made the distinction. This is really a definition of dialectics. Made the distinction between the, what was superfluous and vain and what was essential. Uh, let me uh, give a gloss on this first paragraph. The allusion is to Constantine's moving, that's the other sense, not only the don donation, but moving the seat of the empire from Rome to the east, Byzantium. Okay? And this is seen as the violation of 
a metaphor of history, a paradigm of history, which was called translatio and Translatio Imperi. Uh, what is this? What does it mean? It's the idea, you know, they, in the Middle Ages, they speak of translation, all the time the translation of studies, uh, the translation of the empire. The idea that the whole of history follows a pattern, a movement from east to west. And therefore, the, uh, the, the, the duration of history is patterned on the movement of the sun from east to west. And with the idea that when the empire reaches the most western point, the westernmost point of, uh, of the map, that's going to be also the end of history. It's the end of the day, the sunset, and the end of history. Okay, so Constantine, by turning back the, this translation, this movement, that's what it means, a transport, a transfer um, uh, of, of the empire actually delays the apocalyptic denouement, the end of time and the end of the day. And for Dante, this is a major violation of the economy of history. So it begins with this idea of a, a violation, a tragic violation of history brought about by uh, Constantine. And the allusion, of course, is the other allusion is to Aeneas, with whom the empire had started, after the fall of Troy, had started to go west, westward. And then Constantine reverses all of this. You understand, by the way, this is, I mean this is uh, uh, on, on election day, I really should mention this, that the whole idea of manifest destiny is really based on this principle of the translatio imperi, because the empire moves westward all the time. Uh, so uh, we are now, therefore, uh, in the proper uh, compass uh, of uh, of history, so to speak. Uh, okay, so constant with Lavinia, who went backwards. Lavinia, why for the the um, of Aeneas? Uh, I must also indicate to you, and this would be coming in case you are still looking for a topic. This is one of the first times that Dante starts using this geographical coordinates, this geographical description of Europe. He has really not done that in neither in Inferno nor in purgatory. But now Europe becomes a, an increased co concern of his, whatever historical information may have of it. Now, and it's, it's uh, uh, this is uh, uh, the Europe at the east, and Dante will be talking about the, 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 the borders of Europe in the west. There's a kind of idea of, of, of a Europe that has, he's asking what kind of messages can come from Europe, which is still valid, legitimate today. This is a sort of incredible question that he will ask um, and distinguishes between Rome and Europe. In the sense that Rome, he will say, in a political tract that he writes, that the history of Rome is different from the history of Europe 1320, he writes this kind of thing. 1318, maybe, he writes this tract. And the, em the, the, the emblem for Europe's, uh, from sorry, for Rome's distinctiveness is to be found in Aeneas' experience of marrying three wives. He marries Creusa, as we hear from the Aeneid. He marries Dido, though it's a marriage of convenience, so to speak, but it's a marriage. And, um, and then he marries Lavinia. And Dante goes on to explain the three, wi the three wives he marries are one from Asia, one from Africa, and one from Europe. So that Aeneas' whole experience, whole history encompasses what at the time was thought of as universality, the three known continents, in a way of which only Europe, Europe is only a part. Okay, so keep that in mind. I will talk more about this metaphor as it appears. Now, this is the context of Europe. So Justinian and uh, the reference to uh, his, uh, um, his, his reorganization 
of the Roman Code, known as the Justinian Code, and then now we have a history of the empire. Uh, from the emperor, we have what seems to be a celebration of the Roman Empire. This is Canto VI, therefore, like Canto VI of Inferno and Canto VI of Purgatorio, the focus is political. It's not just the city or Italy, now it's the whole empire. Uh, and, uh, but what begins as uh, a celebration of the empire, in effect, turns out to be a critique of the ideology of the empire, the, myth the, the mythological reading that we can find in Augustine's Confessions. Uh, Dante follows two models here, and there are two models that are contradictory with each other. In this representation of Canto VI, we have the Virgilian model of the Roman Empire, which is really a celebration of its origins with Aeneas, uh, with Pallas, the whole account told in, in the Aeneid, and, and with the vision of what is to come. But then there is, around the fifth century AD, Augustine writes in the City of God a fierce critique of the empire. The empire has fallen. The claims, by the time Augustine writes, the claims of the eternity of the empire turn out to be hollow. And to Augustine, the empire is nothing less than another one of uh, another episode in the long history of uh, predatory uh, l politics, of imperial uh, possessions and violence. It, r the uh, Roman Empire as an empire is no better than all the other empires that have long been va had long vanished and vanquished. Okay, so this is the, these are the two models that Dante is evoking. And in fact, the very language, just to give you an idea, at one point Dante will say, thou knowest, um, uh, lines 35 and 40, that it is made its stay, um, the eagle, is, the story is told through the vicissitudes of this emblem, of the symbolic emblem, the eagle, for 300 years and more, till at the last, still for its sake, the three, the orazzi, you may, you may know a little bit of Roman history, the Curiazzi, who fight it out with a duel between the three brothers and the other three brothers. The three fought with the three. And you know what's what it did under seven kings, the story of the seven kings, from the wrongs of Sabine women to the war of Lucrece, conquering the neighboring people round about. These are all phrases that come straight out of Augustine's City of God. And they are used as cases of exemplifying the libido of power in Rome. There are erotic stories of erotic violence. Lucretia, who has been raped, and the story of the Sabine women who have been kidnapped by the, the, uh, the bands of uh, Romulus and Remus, and the other outlaws. There's this idea that the empire was, was born in, uh, in a condition of outlaws. So Dante is using the perspective of Augustine because Augustine had used these examples to them, the empire and its own aberrant policies. But at the same time, all the rest is really Virgilian. This is the moment when Virgil and Augustine really disagree from each other. Why does Dante do this? What is, this, what is the reason for bringing together two contradictory sources of historical uh, thought? I mean, what is, what, what's the idea of poetic mythology of Rome? Is he in favor of the empire or is he against the empire? Uh, is he with Augustine or is he with, um, actually with Virgil? We, one thing is clear, that Augustine, who loves Virgil, of course, uh, decides that, this is, that the empire is an aberrant uh, reality in his own history. It's already falling, falling apart and uh, uh, he has no use for this. In his theological vision, the question that he raises is, what do I care who governs me, provided this is he, that do, they do not make me sin. The reality is an internalized reality. The reality is the one which is in the interior life of all of us. And what are empires? if not great thefts. He will go on dismissing uh, all of this. He, a Roman citizen, at, 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 at the end, at the twilight of the empire, uh, the sixth century or so. Uh, so what is, where does Dante stand in between them? So he continues, I have an answer, I hope. Uh, he continues for now, 
we don't, he doesn't tell us yet. Uh, thou knowest that it was born by the illustrious Romans against Brunus. Um, uh, it brought, her, brought low the pride of the Arabs, who behind Hannibal passed the alpine crags from which Poe uh, uh, follows, uh, thou fallest. Under it, uh, as youth, Scipio and Pompey triumphed, then near the time, etc. Uh, this will continue into the violation of the Rubicon by Caesar, and, uh, it, it, uh, and then it goes on with Charlemagne, line 95 and following. And now let me just read the, the passage, the last passage. Now thou canst judge of such men as I accused before, um, and of their offenses, which are the cause of all your ills, the one opposes to the public standards, the yellow lilies, and the other claims, the ye lilies of friends, and the other claims it for a party, so that it's hard to see which offends thee more. Let the ghibellines, the cant all of a sudden becomes evocative, seems to turn into a replica of Inferno VI, of the civil war between Welfs and ghibellines. It starts as a celebration an encomium of the empire and its role in history, right? In this westward movement of, uh, of, of toward an apocalyptic conclusion. And now all of a sudden it goes back to let the Ghibellines carry on the arts under s another standard, for of this he's always a bad follower who serves it from justice. And let not this new child strike at it with the whelms, but let him fear its claws, which have torn the hide from a greater lion. Many time before now have the children wept for the father's fault, and let him not think God will change arms for uh, their lilies. So what is this? It starts with the empire ends up with the civil war, and the civil war is really the perspective from which Dante can take this double view on the history of the empire, where Dante can really stand up to the, 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 the stance of Augustine and the stance of, uh, of, of, a, uh, of, of Virgil. And that, what he really seems to be saying, I think, is this. Yes, Augustine, you are right, that the empire is really uh, a negative force, in, has been a negative force in history. And that the reality is the, as you say, an internalized reality of our own, um, of our own peace, the, the kind of internal will that we can we manage to placate. Uh, at the same time, he says to Virgil, but you are also right in your valorization of the empire, because the empire has brought about some order and laws into the world. So that's the argument. And yet, against Augustine, he says, if there were no laws, and there were no laws of the empire, then there would be no way of sheltering each and every one of us in case of the civil war. What makes the argument for the necessity of the empire is the reality of the civil war, which really demands the presence of a transcendent institution that will manage to contain the violence of human beings. So you can see he agrees with Augustine and disagrees with Augustine. He agrees with Virgil and disagrees with Virgil. Virgil leaves no room for the internal, the inner experiences of uh, Christians. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Augustine leaves no room for the necessity of an outside structure that could uh, order the appetites of human beings. The canto, though, comes to an end with uh, uh, a little bit of an autobiographical uh, portrait, an autobiographical uh, picture. Um, uh, this is now the emperor who praises a counselor, a counselor who has fallen into disgrace. Uh, within this small, the same pearl shines to the light of Romeo, Romeo Villeneuve, a Provencal courtier who had the role of uh, exactly of being the, the a counselor for uh, the prince, whose great and noble work was ill-rewarded. But the Provencals who wrote against him do not have the laugh, and indeed he takes an ill road who makes of another, another's well-doing a wrong to himself. Raymond Berenger had four daughters, each of them a queen, and Romeo, a man of low birth, and the stranger did this for him. 
And when crafty tongues moved him to call to account this just man who rendered him seven and five for ten, Romeo left the poor, left their poor and old. And if the world knew the heart he had, begging this bread by morsels, much as it praises him, it would praise him more. It is an oblique uh, representation of Dante himself, who has to end up uh, begging and poverty for a morsel, as he says, out of the, uh, the, the, the selfishness of uh, the political powers. But the, uh, the other final question, I think it underlies this whole, whole canto that has to be raised, is what is the relationship between dialectics and this representation of history? Why should Dante connect the two? Why in the heaven of logic, let's say, does he have to talk about history? Um, and I think that the idea is that history itself, um, I think that his, this is an encomium that ends up being not quite an unmitigated encomium. Uh, it's also a critique of the empire, that there is a reason within the empire, and yet this reason doesn't quite justify all that the empire has perpetrated in history. And I think from this perspective, Dante is also forcing on us some perplexities about the nature of logic as an instrument of power, as one that could justify all possible powers. So there's also a critique of, uh, of dialectics as much as there is a critique of, uh, of history. And we skip all together because I think it's a little bit more evident. And you can, if you read on your own, uh, you can see Canto 8 and 9, the Canto of Rhetoric and um, Rhetoric and Love. They are very nine, especially, very clear. We move instead to the Heaven of the Sun, which is a little bit 10, 11, and 12. Uh, I don't know that I'll be able to finish all of Canto 10, but I want to start the discussion here. We are in the Heaven of the Sun which is the, the, heaven of, uh, the heaven of arithmetic, numbers. And here Dante goes on talking about one model of the Trinity that I will describe to you uh, in a moment. Uh, Dante encounters the wise spirits, the spirits of, uh, in fact, we are going to see very soon, uh, there are um, two wheels of uh, saints, two garlands, represented as two garlands, of old men who hold themselves by the hand dancing around, around the sun. It is the dance of wisdom, if you wish. It is the, 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 you could call it, you could also refer to it as a kind of a reorganization of the encyclopedia. You may remember that I used this metaphor at the beginning of the, of the course, uh, this idea that the Divine Comedy is, uh, tries to repropose a new circle of knowledge, a way in which things can really be known and, and, and the encyclopedia means uh, uh, the journey, uh, education is in a circle. Because you, the mind moves around through the various arts and sciences. That, that's, that's how you learn. That's, you return to what you already knew from a different viewpoint, and you see things, uh, things are new. And it's, uh, it, but it's the heaven of the sun. Let me just go on a little bit with, um, with the canto, and then we'll, we'll try to bring out some of the, the issues uh, of uh, uh, Canto 10, looking on his son with the love which the one and the other eternally breathe forth, a primal and ineffable power made with such order all that revolves in mind or space that he contemplates it cannot but taste of him. He begins with a Trinitarian representation, the father, the son joined together by the breath of love. This treat, that was the idea of, of the Trinity, which is a unity. That's the paradoxes of arithmetic, of this theological arithmetic. Uh, is a an image of fecundity. Uh, God is, being an image of love, is generative of itself uh, within his own uh, unity. And then Dante turns to us, and that's the last time, I believe, that he turns to us readers. And he tells us to be stargazers. That's all. That's all he's saying. Lift up thy eyes with me then, reader, to the lofty wheels, directing them on that path where the one motion strikes the other. And from a point, take their pleasure 
in the art of the master who so, so loves it in his heart that his eyes never leaves it. See how from there the circle branches obliquely that be bears the planets to satisfy the world which calls for them. He directs our eyes to an intersection of uh, the ecliptic, the, equa the cosmic equator and the ecliptic, the ecliptic being a term that describes the, the diurnal and annual movement of the sun. You know, so the, where they meet, that, that crossing, uh, that, that directs our eyes there. If the track were not a slant, etc. Stay now, reader, on thy bench, thinking over this so which thou hast a taste, and thou shalt have much delight before thou art weary. I have set before thee, now feed thyself, for the theme of which I make describes bent to itself all my care. Why does Dante think of the Trinity and the, in the heaven of the sun? This is the simple question that we should ask. I have a passage that I want to read to you. It's taken from, because I think this is the, it's taken from the, the Pseudo Dionysius. You may have heard of uh, whom Dante will mention. It's a, myth, it's a mystic. Um, um, uh, the, uh, and he writes in the, in the, on the divine names. He writes about the mystical hierarchy. Uh, and, and this will explain to you a little bit of the, what is Dante's, at this point, semi-mystical theology, semi-mystical idea of uh, the Trinity. Um, this idea that knowledge has to be love. He begins with an idea of the Trinity bound by love and that knowledge has to be love. Let me read this passage and uh, maybe we can go from there. It's, it, I call it a solar theology. Uh, uh, that is to say, a, a theology of the sun, a theo not about the sun, but solar. The theology is to be understood as the life of the sun itself, as S U N. Let me read this passage. Think, this is from uh, 693b on the divine names and following. Think of how it is with the sun. It exercises no rational process, no act of choice, and yet, by the very fact of its existence, it gives light to whatever is able to partake of its light in its own way. So it is with the good. A classical comparison here, of course, of the sun with the good in the Republic of Protinus, in the, in the Aeneids, and so on. So it is with the good, existing far above the sun, an archetype far superior to its dull image. It sends the rays of its undivided goodness to everything with a capacity such as this may be to receive it. Such beings owe their presence and their uneclipsed and their diminished lives to this race. They abide in the goodness of God and draw from it the foundation of what they are, their coherence, their vigilance, their home. Their longing for the good makes them what they are and confers on them their well-being. Shape by what they yearn for, they exemplify goodness. And as the law of God requires of them, they share with those below them the good gifts which have come their way. Uh, I call it a solar uh, theology in the sense that Dante is, the, I think, thinking of uh, theology as, uh, or God, or the, the Trinity, as a giving, as a fountain. Not the uh, Aristotelian or um, domestic or Augustinian idea of causality. You know, we think of God as the one who imparts a cause or emotion to things or a beginning, and then you have a teleology, you have effects. The idea of the Trinity here is one of uh, an inexhaustible source that keeps giving and it gives to all. And we're all part of this gift. This is the idea. Uh, I think that Dante is getting this, what I call the solar theology, from a mystical text called the Pseudo Dionysius. Again, not that he is a mystic, but he indeed appears as one who is uh, uh, behind the rationalist facade of his thinking, is aware of depths 
uh, and other ways of thinking which are, which are not those of the rational, rational route. Um, and let me just uh, uh, go from, uh, uh, describe even more here what, what happens with, uh, with this Cantor 10. Um, uh, now, uh, Dante goes on seeing these two, um, uh, these two, uh, these two garlands of uh, uh, saints, uh, and uh, uh, this is. Uh, uh, let me read. Uh, um, he meets Aquinas, and let me read from this passage where he uh, Aquinas will go on giving and naming the first uh, encyclopedic. This movement of sages, uh, lines 100 and following, where he says, I was of the lambs of the holy flock that Dominic leads on the path where there is good fattening if they do not stray. He that is next beside me on the right was my brother and master, Albert of Cologne, and I am Thomas Aquinas. If thou wouldst be thus informed of all the rest, follow after my words with thine eyes, going round the blessed wreath. The next flame comes from the smile of Grecian, who served canon law and civil law, the one and the other court so well that it gives pleasure in paradise. The other who next adorns a choir was Peter, who like the poor a widow offered his treasure to the Holy, the Holy Church. And then the fifth light, which is the most beautiful among us, breathes from such a love that all the world below hungers for news of it. Within it is the lofty mind to which was given wisdom so deep that if truth be true, there never arose a second of such a vision. It's Solomon, described through a circumlocution of, as the fifth light. And the fifth light because in numerical symbolism, five stands for the natural number, which is to say that Dante casts a very difficult proposition Solomon as being naturally perfect, having a kind of perfection of intellect. It's a dangerous uh, proposition. In fact, Dante will go on, Aquinas will go on in Canto 14, says, look, let me just explain what I said before, because it's not quite true, because he says the, the, the virtue of, intellectual virtue of Solomon consists in the fact that he knew what to ask for when he had to govern his people. He was the perfect king because he knew how, what to ask. Uh, you understand why this would be a dangerous idea if you believe that there is a perfection of the intellect in, within the natural immanent sphere, order where we live, then it means that there is no need for revelation. There is no need for intermediaries, no need for redemption. If, the, if, if nature, the natural intellect is capable of ascending as it is claimed here for Solomon, then the whole apparatus will collapse. Dante will not believe it, and Aquinas will go back as a dramatically, actually, in Canto 13, saying, let me just uh, explain myself. Beside it is the light of the candle, which below in the flesh was farthest, uh, etc. Uh, this is uh, and this, uh, Augustine. And then uh, skip the body from which he was driven lies below in Cheldauro. This is Boethius, uh, and he came from martyrdom and exile to his peace. See flaming beyond the glowing breath of Isidore, Bede, Richard of St. Victor, who in contemplation was more than man, line 132. Let me read this line because I think it's a little bit more interesting in the Italian than it is in English. In contemplation was more than man. Uh, Isidoro, Beda, e di Riccardo, che a considerar fu più che viro. The word Dante uses is not contemplation, it's consideration. And it's a key word for Dante because consideration means the etymology is that of moving with the stars. It's as if the mind, it's at its most perfect when it imitates the circulation and circularity of the stars. Consider. Uh, it's also like desire, by the way. Um, this one from whom they look returns to me is the light of a spirit to whom in his grave thought Death seems slow in coming. It is the eternal light of Seger who lecturing the street of straw demonstrated invidious truths. The last one uh, that Aquinas points out in, this, uh, in this, uh, this circulation of wise spirits is one of a so-called heretic by the name of Seger 
of Brabant, who was an Averroist and was condemned for his Averroism. Whatever knowledge and whatever canonized knowledge we may have, for Dante it includes figures who had been judged unworthy of knowledge or heretical or wrong, and now they are retrieved. So the idea of knowledge is one that keeps changing. The idea of the canon of knowledge keeps always expanding and including voices that had been rejected. Let me tell you more about this representation of Seger of Brabant. You understand he's an Averroist? And we do know, how does Dante go about, other than just saying he's here, how does he go about uh, justifying his salvation? Uh, Canto 10, from this point of view, is uh, retrospectively sh uh, one that sheds light on Canto 10 of Inferno, where we also saw, you remember, the Averroists and the Epicureans, uh, Guido, Cavalcanti, those who believed uh, that the mind, uh, uh, that l l love and knowledge never interact with each other, that the, the, that the mind uh, uh, goes, rationality is, is darkened and dimmed by the intrusions of the passions, right? You remember? And that the mind is one that receives ideas from the outside, all that, uh, that notion of, uh, of uh, both the inertia of the will and the divisions within the mind itself. Dante now is, is, is correcting some of those views. So let's look a little bit at these metaphors in Canto 10. This one, from whom the look returns to me, is the light of a spirit to whom, in his grave thoughts, death seemed low, slow in coming. He was killed, by the way, by a madman. Uh, and Dante writes a sonnet about him in um, uh, around 1281 uh, uh, or so. It is the eternal light of Seger. So we know that he's saved, uh, who, lecturing in the street of straw, demonstrated invidious truths. Dante gives the address of this man. He lectured, a word that it's, uh, has, has uh, a certain value in the university language, a university lexicon of the time. Uh, lecturing is uh, an activity that implies glossing, just as the glossator of Aristotle, but he tells us where he lived, in the, in, the, in, the, in the street of straw in Paris, a street that now is called, by the way, the, the Rue de Foire, but is now called the Rue Dante, knowing that clearly the, the Parisians are mindful of this passage. Uh, Dante is placing Seger on the road, on the way. He's giving us his, uh, his, his uh, his address, but he's telling us that his thinking takes place while he is on the road. You all know, you all know that philosophy is always understanding itself as a journey, a method, an exodus, right? Uh, Parmenides, or Aquinas who thinks about the five ways to reach the, the ultimate uh, truths about God. And here for Dante is a philosopher is on the way to uh, theological certainty, theological truth, and theological knowledge. And he de de demonstrated invidious truths. The Italian is syllogizo, made syllogisms out of, uh, in, or, or, or demonstrated, rationally demonstrated invidious truths. What are these invidious truths? Invidious truths, I, I, I'm not sure that. Um, all the translators would agree. Invidious truths have to be understood etymologically. This is the canto where Isidore of Seville is present, the, the, the Isidore of Seville being the arch etymologist of the Middle Ages. And Dante is showing how too he can play with etymologies. You know, Isidore of Seville is the one who believed that the whole of knowledge, the high, all, all we know, the higher, the, the uh, the compass of all knowledge can really be arrived at through etymologizing language. Language, the etymon of language, the origin of words will give us an access to the nature of reality. So language becomes a way of knowing the world. Dante indulges in the same activity, calling the truths that Seger pursued invidious, which etymologically means those things, those truths that cannot be demonstrated, those truths that cannot be seen. Philosophy appears as an art of speculation that takes us on the way to a truth that it cannot quite have access.
to? What are these truths that Seeger of Brabant sought access to? Um, the, the immortality of the soul? There's no way he would have known or even discovered that. Aristotle is very doubtful about the, Im the individual immortality of the soul in the treatise of the soul. He tried to consider, to view, uh, to, to decide about uh, the origin of the world. Seeger believed that the universe is uh, uh, another one of those uh, undemonstrable uh, beliefs that the universe is eternal, right? And this is an argument that so medieval thinkers and theologians engaged in. Averroes on the one side and Aquinas who maintains that philosophically you really can believe and show that the universe is really uh, is eternal, but out of faith you can go on believing in creation, that things have a beginning. Because if don't, you don't think that things have a beginning, then there's never a possibility of, of, of uh, uh, allowing for, giving some ground and, and, and rooting the idea of your freedom, your innovations, the possibility that things can be different from you, from what they were before, and so on. The reason why Dante rescues Seizure of Brabant is a way for him, though, ultimately of thinking and making us think that whatever we believe that is knowledge, it's never definite, and it's always, we are literally on the way and rethinking it and making it all the time uh, an object of our own uh, self-critique. This is not the only thing, the only uh, place where Dante is rethinking himself. Very soon, uh, around the notion of the Trinity, Bonaventure will have to change his mind about a, a man, a figure that I have mentioned before, Joachim of Flora in the next canto. The idea with a Joachistic interpretation of history. So he will, uh, he will, we are going to have a canto 11 balancing off uh, canto, uh, canto 10. And then it ends, the canto ends, they're like a clock. What an extraordinary image, it's an image of time now. But what I have to say is that you probably do not know that clocks, mechanical clocks, the way we still see them, were the, the, a, a, a recent technological invention in uh, the late 13th century, which Dante is absorbing here. Uh, then like a clock that calls us at the hour when the bride of God rises to sing matins to the bridegroom that he may love her, when one part draws or drives another, sounding the chime with notes so sweet that the well-ordered spirit swells with love, so I saw. Uh, the glorious uh, will move and render voice to voice with harmony and sweetness that cannot be known, but there where joy becomes uh, uh, eternal. Uh, uh, and Dante is describing the songs of the eternal, uh, of the, the, the blessed souls in erotic, uh, in erotic, uh, erotic terms, so that what seems to be a cant of pure knowledge ultimately becomes a love song too, and this is the, um, the whole trajectory of Canto 10. Let me stop here and see if there are some questions about these three, three cantos, uh, uh, which I'll be glad to, to answer. They're a little bit abstract, but I think that they respond to genuine, uh, uh, generally interesting historical problems at least. The question of allegory of at the beginning, and just to give a kind of uh, quick resume of uh, what we, we said, in Canto 4 you have two issues. Uh, you have the issue of uh, allegory and the issue of the will, um, where Dante goes on uh, explaining the mode of representation in uh, paradise as a mode of accommodation to our limited faculty. And he thinks that this is really the mode of representation throughout. Uh, the Bible, uh, the iconography of the church, the poem, uh, etc., which is a way, therefore, of talking about allegory in a slightly different form from, uh, from the, the, the way he spoke of it in, uh, as you remember, when I spoke of it, but he was uh, forced, uh, allowing us to do that in Canto 9 of Inferno, 
what we, we had been talking about, the allegory of poets, allegory of theologians. Now there is no question that I think that there is, really, there is, is no intrinsic difference between the two modes. You remember that I used to talk about the allegory of theologians as being an allegory where the literal level is true and the allegory of poets as one in which the literal level is a fiction. Now I'm saying that both of them for Dante have a kind of metaphorical basis. Okay, both the, the, and the relationship between the metaphor and the truth is, it's, it's, of course, it's, it's certainly the language of a very similitude, if not absolutely the truth. And then the two, the other issue about uh, uh, the will, the limitations of the will, um, the conditional and absolute will. When we can't come to Canto Six of Paradise, Dante shifts gear altogether and talks about history uh, and uh, the, uh, the framework of the empire. Trying to Is it providential? I call it, what is the rationality of the empire? But the, act, the, the real issue is, is there such a thing as a providentiality of the empire, uh, which he had maintained in um, elsewhere in the poem and certainly in the, in the text of Monarchia. Uh, Dante concludes, now seems to, to have to give an apology for his belief in the empire uh, by agreeing with and, and siding with Virgil, but at the same time giving a critique of the empire and acknowledging Augustine, but manages to criticize both both Augustine and uh, for different reasons and Virgil had not seen the whole truth uh, Virgil uh, can go on into an abashed laudatio, laudatory statements about the empire. Augustine can go on damning the empire, but Augustine does not understand that if uh, in, with, uh, within the context of the Civil War, uh, where, where you know the realities where Corso can turn against his sister Picarda, where the Guelphs can go against the Ghibellines, where your own brother can be your enemy, that's, that's really what it's about, uh, then you do need some kind of law. You need an outside world, uh, an outside institution that can guarantee and protect uh, the, the, uh, yourself. The claim uh, that salvation is only in the, in the interiority of the soul, uh, which is Augustine's claim, is not really sufficient for someone who is, in, as Dante, who is involved in uh, the public sphere and the public life. Uh, I think that these are the two most important moments. In Canto 10, Dante is uh, moving beyond the, the it's, 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 it's a poetic break that takes place. He literally moves us beyond the, the sunlight, the daylight uh, of the ordinary natural daylight. We move into a world now which is his own. And Dante uh, starts raising the issue of uh, uh, knowledge. As if to say that a new knowledge, a new way of thinking now is necessary. Once you move beyond the ordinary boundaries of, uh, of the universe, you, gotta ha you, you start asking yourself, what kind of knowledge do I need here? And he's rethinking, therefore, uh, the, the, the whole relationship between truth or, or knowledge and error heresies and knowledge, uh, the canonical uh, certainties that Aquinas would have, who now makes significantly enough a mistake about the fate of Solomon and the uh, and seizure of Brabant. So that, that seems to be the, the argument that is running uh, in this, uh, this cantos. He is forcing on us a different way of thinking. And that different way of thinking begins with a redefinition of uh, nothing less than the Trinity. Uh, not the idea of causality, not the idea of efficiency, you know, cause efficience, is, that's the way God is defined by Aquinas. That's the, the way that Augustine, uh, the Augustine defines Aquinas. He writes a treatise on the Trinity uh, with the idea of God is causality. Dante adds, doesn't exclude the others. It would be inconceivable that something as imponderable as the Trinity could just have one formula to account for it, but he adds on to it that first definition of the Trinity as a unity of love uh, and the unity of fecundity, which I think is a mystical definition. The idea of God, the idea of creation as one of, of participation of the creatures. The idea of God as being the source, the inexhaustible source of light, uh, and not just efficiency, and not just uh, teleology, movement, etc. And we shall see the implications of this as we go. Yes? I was just wondering, why is it so, such a problem for Dante to imagine like, um, a perfect natural intellect and intellect that is not Because isn't it sort of um, internal and purgatory, sort of the perfection of the will through Virgil's intellect and Virgil's reason? And so 
why why is this again just one good thing to say that a man could have like the perfect regret for God? Right. Uh, the question, a very good question, uh, is uh, why does Dante find it so difficult to acknowledge the perfection of Solomon's intellect uh, when, after all, in Inferno and Purgatory we have had um, some accounts of uh, how the will is uh, moved by the intellect and perfected by the intellect. Am I um, paraphrasing your, actually repeating what you said, I think, but accurately? Um, it's a very good question. It's really a complicated problem. And, and uh, in fact, I think that what you have, uh, um, you, you have to keep in mind how Dante talks about uh, Solomon. It's that people on earth are so anxious. We see, this was one of the most incredibly debated. Uh, pro is he saved? Is Solomon saved? Is he the wisest? You know, that's what the Bible tells us. He's the wisest. And we believe the Bible, the Middle Ages argument. We believe the Bible. So he's the wisest. But he was also known as being the most lecherous of kings. So big solution for Dante, ah, forget about that. He's, he's really uh, uh, the wisest, so he's saved. So that solves that particular issue of the relationship between love and knowledge. And I think that's a crucial point in, for the way you are stating the issue, because you are stating how in Inferno and Purgatory we have the will directed and reorganized by the intellect. Uh, so you see that there must be some kind of relationship between will and intellect. Dante here says the will was really, uh, uh, was, was a little bit, was chaotic, was disordered will. So we have only to judge him in terms of this majestic intellect that he has. In fact, he, he was the most perfect of uh, figures since Adam was created in the garden. You know, okay. So that's, that's the first thing. But now let me come to the, the crux of the matter here. If you believe that he had an intellect which was absolutely perfect, perfect intellect, then what you're really saying, and this is the context of knowledge, a mathesis, as the Greeks call it. Okay, the mathesis, the word mathematics, comes from that. And if you believe that, then you're really saying that philosophy is the way to come to the truth. You see what I'm saying? And if philosophy is the way to come to the truth, you don't really need theology. You really have to start thinking of theology as some kind of vulgar poet or some vulgar philosophizing, and some kind of uh, the poetry for, for the masses, for instance, you know, a kind of uh, uh, elitarian, uh, elite-like view that keeps uh, 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 creeping up into, in, 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 in the ways of thinking about theology and, uh, and, and, and philosophy. And if you believe that, that philosophy is the mode, in fact, now we have a correction of the philosophers immediately after with the presence of seizure. Because of course, see the ambivalence, seizure is justified and saved. Because his mind was a searching mind. He's on the road. He's a true philosopher. He, it's the method. I was describing logic as a method. That the Greek word, that means way. Uh, it's the, the root. Uh, you know, the philosophers are on the root. The philosophers are on the way, are on the odyssey. The odyssey of the soul, that's really, we call it, Dante says, exodus. This is a, an exodus, clearly countering the idea of the philosophical root. There's another, another story, another way of looking at journeys. He's certainly involved in a journey, a journey of the heart and a journey of the mind at the same time. So once you, you, you go on, uh, seizure is on the, so, but there, is n there was no perfection. He tried to demonstrate, uh, look at the paradox invidious, that is to say, truths that cannot be seen. I appeal to the etymology of invidious. Many translations, and uh, uh, I, uh, they say unwelcome truths. You know, I don't know what kind of translations. Actually, I like my Saint Clair who says invidious truths. But many others translate that word invidious as, as unwelcome, or the, the truths that made him uh, be scorned and hated by others, because you know the, the jealousy of philosophers uh, it's, it's a little bit in the background. He lost his life. Uh, he was killed because of that. Uh, but instead, he is in, in pursuit 
of truths, which is you know, the, the aim of philosophy, of um, all investigations, but philosophical investigations, but cannot be demonstrated, that cannot be seen. So there is a limitation of the philosophical road, of the road of philosophy, and indirectly the limitation of Solomon's perfect claim of, he never claimed it, but the, the, that he had a perfect intellect. And in fact, Aquinas, who realizes what he has said, he says, no, 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 the, 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 the wisdom of Solomon has to be viewed in his prudence for asking God that he be given the absolute uh, knowledge in the government of his people. So it's a limited form of knowledge, but that was perfect. You see, it's, maybe it strikes you as sophistry, um, but I enjoy that. Okay, all right. Thank you so much.